Okay, so welcome back to Psychology as a Human Science here at the University of West Georgia. This video will be video number two in a series about existential psychology. But first, let's get the crazy coronavirus hair a little bit under control with the hat of the day. <laughs> it's a camo hat, so I hope you'll still be able to see me when I put it on. I won't just vanish like some kind of chameleon. But at any rate, okay, let's see how, I think that's okay, you can still see my face. All right, so, well, looking good. So, um, at any rate, in the previous video, what we did was we reviewed some of the central themes and features of existential psychology, and more specifically, of existential psychotherapy. So, the first of those had to do with what Rollo May calls the I am experience, which is basically a way of experiencing the fundamental reality of existence itself. Okay, a relatively rare and, uh, you know, not very common experience, I would say. Uh, the second of those themes has to do with moving more toward authenticity, in other words, moving more into recognizing and ultimately realizing our deeper potentials in life, the things that we uniquely and distinctly have as part of our human birthright that we could possibly make real in the concrete moments of our lives as we live them. The next theme we went over had to do with freedom and responsibility, which are big recurrent motifs within existential thinking for sure and uh, fundamentally interrelated to each other. So the last theme we looked at had to do with committing to one's way of being and doing so with a fair amount of passion as opposed to the alternative, which would be to more or less go robotically and mechanically, kind of like on autopilot through the moments of our lives. So that's all stuff from the previous video. Like I said in the last video, the main thing we're gonna be doing today is touring through a bunch of thinkers, noting some of the central features of their thought and a little bit of their specialized vocabulary. This is going to be a very, I guess, rapid and condensed tour for sure, because each one of these thinkers has many volumes of work that you could possibly get into and many subtleties and nuances that you can possibly explore. But remember, the purpose of this course is just to give you enough of a taste so that you can start to discern whether you want to move more in this direction, take a course in, in this case, existential psychotherapy so that you can start to form the larger pattern of your movement through the psychology program. Okay, all that being said, boom. The first of these existential thinkers that we're going to be look at, looking at, by the way, um, uh, these thinkers are all going to be philosophers and uh, probably what you should keep in the back of your mind is that existential psychology is very much informed by existential philosophy in much the same way that phenomenological psychology was very much informed by phenomenological philosophy. Same kind of deal, all right? So first thinker, Soren Kierkegaard. I gave you his life dates. Actually, I gave you the life dates of all of these thinkers. I don't expect you to memorize the life dates. That's just crazy. Um, I'm putting that there so you get a general sense for the chronology. So that's more for your benefit uh, than it is for in terms of concrete material I'll be asking you about. So Soren Kierkegaard, Kierkegaard, <laughs> whose name literally translated from the Danish means uh, churchyard. And in case you're not uh, sort of familiar with what churchyard means in older English, it means a graveyard next to a church. Okay, so, and that might be appropriate in some ways for Kierkegaard's thought. So Soren Kierkegaard, the so-called grandfather of existentialism, the guy who is noted as the progenitor of the whole existential movement, early 19th century. General characteristics of Kierkegaard's thought, very theistic, very Christian, very Protestant. Okay, right off the bat, you just got to say that about him. In fact, he's so much that way that it's possible to view him not so much as a philosopher, but as a kind of Christian theologian. He also tends to be very individualistic. In fact, one of the sort of uh, elements of the legend of Kierkegaard is that he supposedly wanted the phrase, the individual, to be his epitaph. In other words, the thing that's written on his tombstone, but if you look up his tombstone on the internet, you'll see that it's that's not what's written on his tombstone. Okay, so at any rate, fairly individualistic, definitely very religious, definitely very Christian. Okay, 
one of the inter most interesting elements of Kierkegaard's thought, an emphasis on what he calls subjective truth, okay, over objective truths. Okay, so two modalities of truth. Now, objective truths, from the point of view of Kierkegaard, have to do with truth the way we normally conceive of the truth. And truth the way we normally conceive it, for the most part, in the Western world has to do with truths as meted out by the natural sciences, for, in, for instance. In other words, truths that are the product of empirical observation of stuff that seems to be real in the external world. Okay, so truth in that sense. And of course, the natural sciences is uh, trying to cast truths like that, mostly in terms of principles that govern external objective reality. Okay, so F equals MA and stuff like that. All right, so in addition to that, objective truth also includes the truths of abstract disciplines like mathematics and uh, formal logic. You know, so propositional, abstract propositional logic and that sort of thing. So kind of two domains of objective truth. And objective truth is a wonderful thing as long as that's the paradigm that's appropriate to the area that you're seeking the truth in. So if you're doing chemistry or physics or mathematics, yes, adopting the paradigm of objective truth is definitely the way to go. But as Kierkegaard notes, that is only one sector of issues that concern us as human beings. The other sector has to do with the kinds of truths that will only appear to you as true in terms of your actual first-hand experience. In other words, sometimes you actually have to experience things firsthand for them to count as a truth at all. Okay, so, and you may wonder at this point, like, what kind of truths might those be? Well, Kierkegaard names a bunch of them. Probably the most central one for him is the truth of Christian faith. Like, Christian faith will never <laughs> appear to you as anything more than a fanciful fairy tale until you've experienced it. Right? The only way you're going to regard something like Christian faith as a kind of truth is by way of first-hand experience. Okay? <laughs> so no one is going to be able to sort of argue you into Christian faith because it's not a matter of abstract argumentation in the first place. Okay, so this, this sort of like short circuits a lot of debate about things like, well, does God exist or does not God not exist or, you know, things like that, or is there a need for salvation or what is the nature of sin and so on, which is, of course, you know, or elements of, you know, Christian theology and Christian faith. Well, uh, the truth of that only appears to you as a function of a certain kind of experience, but there are plenty of secular truths that are like that too. Okay, so I would say the truth of falling in love would be an example. In other words, like, uh, the truth of falling in love will never appear to you as a kind of truth until at least you've had a little bit of experience in that domain. All right? So, in other words, like someone can write volumes about the nature of love and it'll never really catch you. It'll never really uh, hook you. It'll never appear to you as any kind of truth until you can relate it somehow to your actual concrete experience in life. And when you think about it, it's like a a lot of truths are like that. Sometimes I like to uh, use this example, which is about jazz in the early 20th century. One of the great, uh, you know, sort of uh, seminal figures in early jazz was Louis Armstrong, who was a famous um, trumpet player, and he was also a vocalist. Probably you'd recognize his voice. It's like really sort of low and gruff, like rah, 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 a little bit like Tom Waits, possibly, you know, <laughs> so, and Louis Armstrong. But at any rate, um, these reporters asked Louis Armstrong, because he was one of the early seminal figures in jazz, like what jazz was about, because they wanted to know, oh, there's this upsurge in music. And uh, Louis Armstrong's response, and I'm not going to quote it directly, but I'll paraphrase it, goes something like this. Well, if you have to ask the question, what is jazz, then you won't understand the answer. <laughs> and sort of like, well, what's that getting at? Well, it seems like some kind of, um, you know, sort of a paradoxical Zen riddle or something like that at first. But what it's getting at is, I think, at the core of this uh, Kierkegaardian uh, realization that some things you have to experience and there's no sense in trying to explain it to you if you don't have at least a little bit of experience that you can relate to it in terms of. 
All right, so jazz is like that, falling in love is like that, Christian faith is like that, um, the truth of your mortality, ooh, nasty one, is kind of like that. All right, so subjective truths, and that may sort of make you question, possibly, <laughs> you know, some of the orthodoxies that structure your experience as young students in an academic college environment, True, too, by the way. So is uh, everything that would sort of fall under the rubric of truth containable in the classes and the academic materials you're learning? And if you follow the arc of this Kierkegaardian idea, it's like, well, only one subset of things that we would possibly regard as true would be containable under that paradigm. There's a whole other, and for Kierkegaard, it's a more important whole other sector of the truth that you have to go out in the world and experience. You can't just read about it and assume you know enough about it. You can't just read a book on love and assume you have fathomed the, you know, the deepest mysteries of the human soul where love is concerned. I mean, that's an illusion, really. And, uh, you know, a lot of life's most important experiences are like that. So, also from Kierkegaard. Here's where we find that insistence on passion and commitment, which I mentioned in the last video, talked a little bit about, and I also mentioned it in the summary of the last video, which I did at the beginning of this video. So uh, for him, passion and commitment, especially with respect to pursuing the depth of the Christian life and Christian faith because he's such an ardent Christian theist, but probably more generally in life too, like it has to do with committing to your way of being you getting it? Your specific, distinct way of being and hopefully maybe moving towards something like authenticity in the process, you know, and doing it with real passion, like real verve, not just sort of, you know, sort of moving through your life like you're check, checking off a bunch of boxes until you can finally get into the, the grave. Like, oh, won't it be so cool to be in the grave, both literally and figuratively, because you'll be at about 55 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, that'll be so cool and it'll be so nice. Well, you know, <laughs> the question is, what's going on before then? All right, what are you going to do before then? And Kierkegaard's answer is, you know, you could just sort of uh, ride the arc of your biological continuity like rats and roaches do until you finally die. But a far better paradigm would be to, to really dig into your way of being and, you know, look to sort of live out what you uniquely are as a singular element of the unfolding of the universe. Like, see how deeply and how powerfully you can ride that ever-cresting wave of your life as it breaks upon the shores of the world. Okay, and to do so with passion, right? Like real passion. Okay, like a deep sense of passionate, yes, passionate engagement with the moments of your existence. Well, what the hell? Why not? You know, since you took the trouble to get all dressed up for your life and everything, like why not live it out with some measure of verve and commitment and passion? What the hell? All right, so uh, next thinker in our hit parade uh, is German, so we're going to be moving south <laughs> geographically. So uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, okay, a little bit of sort of weirdness about his name. Um, I pronounce it in the more German way. Uh, a lot of Americans pronounce it like Nietzsche, Nietzsche. So, uh, you know, if, if you hear people say that, that's sort of the Americanized version, but I sort of studied this under Germans, so uh, I'm used to sort of saying it in a more Germanic way, Nietzsche. Okay, so um, there are his life dates, uh, 1844 to 1900. Okay, so latter half of the 19th century, although actually he had a psychotic break in 1889, and so the last 11 years of his life, basically he didn't produce any uh, books or writings. Well, he produced a few, but they're, they're so freaking out there that uh, no one actually <laughs> engages them very much. Okay, so Friedrich Nietzsche, what's his sort of deal about? What are some of the main themes? So a big emphasis on what he calls overcoming, which means transcending your already existing limitations, whatever they might be, like how you already see the world, what you believe in, what you value, all of that is not your destination. It is, your, it is merely just another step on the long and uncertain road of life. So it's like how, whatever you got, the point is to see what you can do to pass beyond it. Okay, so this is what overcoming is about. So it's a very dynamic 
uh, philosophy in a way, you know, Nietzsche's philosophy, because it's always about sort of engaging the dynamism of whatever there is in life that would carry you beyond where you already are. Okay? And that's particularly true along the terrain of subjectivity, like how you perceive the world. All right? The point of how you perceive the world is to pass beyond however it is you do it right now, to deepen it, to amplify it somehow, to change it, to make it more whatever, uh, aesthetic in some sense. You know? So everything is to be overcome. You know? So what are you doing to overcome yourself? And uh, you know, on the other hand, like what are you doing to stay sort of sta safe and static in your life? Okay, because that's a powerful force in human affairs too, like the resistance to the overcoming adventure of existence is also a powerful dynamic in human affairs. So let's see how I said it in your notes. An emphasis on overcoming the process of transcending our primary limitations and habits, especially with respect to our dominant patterns of values, perceptions, habits, etc. Okay, so Overcoming. Now, there's a very personal side to overcoming, and I'm initially trying to cast it that way because I think you'll be able to relate to it more quickly, but there's also a very social side to overcoming. So it's not just that we as individuals overcome our particular habits and values and modes of perception and all that. Like the same is true of entire societies and even humanity as a whole. So for Nietzsche, the point of being human is ultimately to pass beyond being human. <laughs> okay, so our humanity is not our destination and it's not our condemnation either because life always offers up the possibility that both individually and collectively we can start to pass beyond all of that. We can start to pass beyond everything that has defined and delimited our humanity thus far. And you know, when you think about it, like, wow, what greater adventure could there possibly be than that, in a way, you know. So um, now, uh, how are we, for the most part, these days? Well, uh, Nietzsche, of course, was writing in the late 19th century, and so we have to translate a little bit. Roughly what, 100 and roughly 40 years, 140, 150 years, something like that. Um, so uh, what he said about the latter 19th century is that for the most part, people are uh, stuck in what he calls a slave morality. Okay. In other words, the primary template for viewing life is in terms of uh, seeing ourselves as victims in some sense and uh, enslaved and sort of limited and hemmed in and beaten down and at the same time having a kind of abiding resentment for people who are not that way. You know? <laughs> well, who are the people who are not that way? Well, you know, in ancient times, it would be people like emperors and kings and people like that. So uh, nowadays, probably in American culture, it'd be like celebrities. You know, if you have to look to people who are not particularly stuck in a slave morality, you know, the relatively few people, it would be, you know, people who just kind of do what they want um, when they want and uh, don't feel particularly bad about it. So, you know, it's, it's sort of like, uh, I don't know, maybe Paris Hilton or uh, the Kardashians or who was that guy? Like Ch Charlie Sheen? Charlie, is that right? Martin Sheen? Charlie? Whoever the son is, okay? Um, uh, Tom Cruise, perhaps, you know? Uh, Justin Bieber, or, uh, you know? And it's sort of like interesting to note that figures like that, how often they are the object of people's resentment and irritation. You know, when you, if you think about it, probably the, the large numbers of people who resent people like that uh, actually wouldn't mind if, they were, if their lives were more like the people they resent. So they probably actually wouldn't mind it. You know, most celebrities, okay, let's get real about celebrities for a second. All, they're almost all really rich. Okay, first of all, they're almost all really physically attractive people. Most of them have some kind of talent. You know, most, not all. They have some kind of talent, at least a talent for occupying the limelight. All right, they at least have that. And usually they have some other talent, like Justin Bieber can sing and Charlie Sheen, is that right, can act and Tom Cruise can act. And um, 
you know, I guess you can debate about whether uh, the Kardashians have any real talent at all, but they, I would say they definitely have a talent for putting themselves in the spotlight and maintaining, to me, it's a miracle that they've maintained themselves in the spotlight this long. Uh, you know, the, and by the way, I'm, I think I'm including the Jenner clan in there too, that's sort of this uh, hybridized, <laughs> I don't know a lot about them to be honest, you can probably figure that out, I might as well just admit it. But at any rate, what I do know about it is that people tend to, to view them with some measure of irritation and resentment and they tend to want to put them down. So these celebrities tend to be really rich, really popular, they tend to be physically attractive people. It's rare that you see like a celebrity that is not physically attractive. Okay, so even the least attractive ones are kind of in the in the average range, and most of them are definitely superior in terms of that. They're really popular. They can do whatever the hell they want, when they want, and a lot of the time they don't feel particularly bad about doing that. A lot of the time they don't. So, you know, the, the question of slave morality is, well, you know, actually when you think about it, if you're honest enough about it, like wouldn't you really want your own life to be a little bit more like that. Why like, wouldn't you actually prefer all other factors being equal to be a little bit more rich, a little bit more attractive, a little bit more talented, a little bit more popular, a little bit more uh, having latitude for artistic expression and creation, let's say in the mode of acting or singing or whatever it is you happen to do. Okay, so that's a marker of slave morality. Now, master morality for Nietzsche is the opposite of that. It's people who are just sort of unblocked they're just free to sort of pursue uh, what it is they desire and they, they have the whatever combination of attributes, uh, perhaps talents, perhaps luck. I think luck plays a big part in this to be able to do that. And they don't feel particularly crippled by, oh, I just feel so bad for being so rich and so talented and so popular. Like they're not sort of into that self-pitying thing. You know, it's just that they, they enjoy like the powers that they have. They enjoy being unblocked, you know, I think like people like Tom Cruise and people like that, like they're, you know, that's really what's going on. It's we who feel blocked, right? It's we who resent them because we feel blocked ourselves, that we're acting like slaves and living like slaves in some sense. All right, so that's uh, slave and master morality translated a little bit for the 21st century. So, um, okay, so. Here's another dimension of overcoming. Now, earlier I said that overcoming has an individual side to it, but it also has a very social side. It even applies to humanity as a whole, and that really the adventure of being human has to do with passing beyond what has historically defined and eliminated our humanity so far. So, Nietzsche gives a special term to what might come after our humanity. Like if the human race were to overcome itself deeply enough and long enough, what it might eventually give birth to. And this name, uh, usually the German is retained for this. Uh, the name is there in your notes, Ubermensch. Okay, so Ubermensch. So what is the Ubermensch? Well, it is uh, a place marker, as it were, for something that is only maybe barely imaginable at this point in history if the human race were able to overcome its own humanity long enough and deeply enough that it would give birth to a new order of being altogether beyond itself. All right. So, and at first, uh, when you think of something like this, you may have the thought that, well, uh, yeah, wouldn't it be cool like if we all had like six fingers on each hand, like that would be cool, that'd be a marker of the Ubermensch. Okay, if you think that, you're not thinking deeply enough about this idea, because uh, for Nietzsche, it doesn't matter how many fingers you have on each hand, you know? So, um, what matters is the formations of subjectivity, the meanings that you live by, uh, your particular way of valuing, you know, so uh, how values ultimately constellate your relation to the world and uh, ultimately uh, the concrete uh, realities that you end up living out as a consequence, like that's what really matters. So the Ubermensch, this next step of evolution, if you want to think about it this way, isn't about like growing a tail or something like that. You know, it's, it's uh, uh, about growing a new way of relating to life. Okay, so the, the processes of evolution are, are more across the terrain of our subjectivity than they are about our physical bodies. Okay, so it's more about, if you want to think of it this way, here's a parallel. Um, it's more about like meme-driven evolution than gene-driven evolution. Okay, so 
making a reference to Richard Dawkins in the famous book in the, when was this, the 70s, was it? Late 70s? Thereabouts when he invented the term meme, which of course has become very popular now, but uh, the idea that it refers to now is just a really pale counterfeit of, of Dawkins' idea about memes, because what a meme is, is that the fundamental forces of evolution are no longer about DNA. They are about elements of meaning as they propagate themselves across uh, the terrain of humanity. All right, so the funny little pictures you see, oh, it's like a funny little meme there. It's like, you know, I wish they'd picked a different word because uh, to describe that because, um, you know, the word meme is really sort of deep and resonant far beyond how we've appropriated it or perhaps expropriated. <laughs> that may be a little cynical wisdom there for you in the 21st century. At any rate, so the last element of Nietzsche's thought um, that we're going to touch upon, although there are definitely many others for sure, is uh, the will to power. Okay, so the will to power. So this is Nietzsche's idea about what fundamentally motivates us. And uh, of course, throughout history, there have been many ideas about what the fundamental human motivation is. Like, for instance, the will to pleasure has been a recurrent one, definitely within Western uh, intellectual you know, history and all of that kind of stuff. It's sort of like Aristotle had the idea of eudaimonia, which is sort of like this, a kind of happiness that ultimately is uh, the deep seat of virtue, according to Aristotle. Uh, the behavioral psychologists more or less embodied this idea that, well, what life is ultimately about, at least as pertains to human behavior, is trying to get rewards that are pleasurable for yourself and avoid things that are painful for yourself. So uh, for Nietzsche, uh, that's um, actually a derivative condition that's not fundamental. Like what we're really about is something like the will to power. Some other ideas, the will to truth, okay? So like for Nietzsche, the will to power is more fundamental than the will to truth. Okay, so um, what else? Like the will to meaning, like Viktor Frankl style. <laughs> the will to meaning that, okay, Viktor Frankl was a, a uh, Holocaust, the World War II Holocaust survivor. And um, he sort of formed a school of psychotherapy called logotherapy. And sort of the idea there is that, well, the healthy human life is about aspiring to fulfill some sort of significant meaning in your life. Okay, so that ultimately what life boils down to is a kind of will to meaning. Well, for Nietzsche, all of these things like the will to pleasure, the will to truth, the will to meaning, they're all derivative motivations. Okay, the more fundamental one is a will to power. And uh, power ultimately would include sort of the crude formations of power, like for instance, military power, economic power, political power, stuff like that. But more importantly, it's power as it propagates itself along the terrain of subjectivity once again. So along the terrain of perception and values and uh, habitual modes of meaning that we live out. And if you think about it, like in sort of crude terms, it's like, yeah, you know, if you get people sort of valuing things the right way and thinking the right way, you never have to engage the cruder formations of power in the first place. So if you get people in a certain country thinking in a certain way, you never have to send your military over there to subdue them because they'll already be on the same page as you. So, you know, when you think about the different kinds of power, really the deepest kind of power plays out along the terrain of subjectivity in the first place because it's only as a function of a failure of that kind of power that you have to engage things like military power and economic power and boycotts and political power and all of that stuff in the first place. You know, so the deep seat of power is in people's values and stuff like that. All right, so... Um, there are more subtleties to the will to power, but maybe that's enough for you, to, at least to get you sort of interested in it. All right, we sort of made it through a couple of these thinkers. Uh, evidently, the answer to my original question is it's definitely going to take more than this video. Okay, so let's stop this one here and do the rest of them in the next video in the series. So I hope you have a great, wonderful day. Um, so far, we've only talked about thinkers from the 19th century, but that'll definitely change in the next video. So you can await with bated breath, as it were, the advent of video number three in this series. But until, until then, definitely have a good one. Take care of yourself. Bye-bye.